Back in Future State, DC brought in a lot of writers from outside the comic book world, specifically Jeremy Adams, Megan Fitzmartin, Tim Sheridan. A lot of them had worked on stuff like Supernatural. Some of them had worked on DC animated projects. I would say Jeremy Adams has worked out. Megan Fitzmartin and Tim Sheridan, not so much. And one of the things Tim Sheridan talked about getting ready for his Teen Titans Academy run was he was introducing 10 new LGBTQ characters, but the run did not work and ended up getting canceled prematurely. He went on to Twitter to talk about LGBTQ characters and how people don't want them. And here to talk to me about that is my good friend, Aaron Sparrow. How are you doing, Aaron? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Wes? I'm doing fantastic. So I am not the biggest fan of Tim Sheridan. I don't think any of his comics that he's written for DC yet are really particularly good, <laughs> except for the stuff he's co- co-writing with Jeff Johns in Flashpoint Beyond with also Jeremy Adams as well. Tim Sheridan has pretty much failed across the board, and he went out there and said some incendiary stuff on Twitter. First up, he said, comics fans, quote, don't add stuff to establish characters, just create new characters, unquote. Creator being himself creates new character comic fans come back with i don't know them i don't want to this is trash i think that is an oversimplification on why a lot of his projects specifically teen titans academy didn't work dc comics gave him a lot of advantages with that teen titans academy series teen titans have been very very successful over the years nightwing dick grayson is a prime time almost a list character for dc comics you've got wally west in there starfire raven a lot of really recognizable characters And they brought in Red X from the animated universe, which was the big mystery box for his series. So it felt like DC really went out of their way to give Tim Sheridan and his Teen Titans Academy run a chance. But the writing was just subpar. And I think he's kind of convoluting people rejecting his writing for people rejecting his LGBTQ characters. Yeah, it's it's an interesting uh, an interesting projection. If. You have a book with Nightwing, who is one of the most popular characters, and it fails. I have to say that you probably did something wrong, because you've got, like I said, one of the most popular characters in DC Comics. Everybody loves Dick Grayson. Dick Grayson's fantastic. He's a great leader. He's a great character. He's had so many great creators over the years that have worked on him and contributed to him, from Marv Wolfman to Chuck Dixon. You know, Nightwing is really beloved. So if you've got him leading a book, you've got a huge step up in the market already, because people are going to check it out. What you have to do is you have to then keep them interested and you have to write stories that are compelling. And, you know, I read Teen Titans Academy. Uh, you know, I don't want to get to, get too mean, but it was, let's just say it was not for me, uh, even being a huge Dick Grayson fan. I didn't really di- recognize Dick Grayson. I didn't think he was interesting in the book. I didn't think that they did anything compelling with him. And the characters that they introduced, I didn't find interesting. It had nothing to do with them being new characters. I'm on board for new characters. I love, uh, you know, creating characters and I love seeing new characters created. But it, there was just nothing there that grabbed me. And I think there's a misconception among comic writers that if you introduce new LGBTQ characters in Marvel and DC at this point, like you're doing something special and people will be drawn to it. I hate to break it to them. I would say at a minimum, 50, 55 percent of all new characters created in the last three years are LGBTQ representative characters. So just doing that does not separate your new character from the rest. It kind of just makes them the status quo for the industry right now and you really have to work hard to get your character over we've seen james tynan do that he have something is killing the children uh, creator own work he also introduced new lgbtq characters within his batman series and shockingly one of them is leading the upcoming uh, batman incorporated series that's coming out it's not impossible to get these new characters over but you have to create compelling characters if the only thing that you have to say about the character is that they're LGBT, that's not interesting. That's not compelling. It's not. It's not. It's not anything fresh. At this point, it feels. At this point, current day, it feels really cliche. Uh, you know, like you said, over fifty percent of the characters being introduced uh, are representative in some way. But then that's all the. That's all the work that it seems like the writer feels like putting into them. I would rather see a character introduced and have their sexuality be ambiguous for a while while they establish what the actual interesting things about these characters are. And then maybe we get a reveal, you know, as to their sexuality. That's not the most important thing about the character. It's not the most interesting thing about the character. It's not even the most interesting thing about people. You know, when you go to somebody's Twitter bio and the first thing in their bio is their sexuality, uh, you know, that doesn't that doesn't make me any more compelled to, you know, be interested in what they have to say. It's whether or not they have something interesting to say or there's something interesting about them personality wise. And that's what you have to infuse in characters. Uh, I don't think that I think what Tim is actually doing is he's kind of tipping his hand in a way that maybe he didn't intend. He's saying, well, you say that you don't want me changing the sexuality of existing characters. 
so I create new LGBT, you know, characters, and then you're not interested in those, you know? So what he's essentially saying is, you don't want LGBT characters. You're tired of them. You're not interested in them. You don't, you know, that, that, that just doesn't hook you into them. So what I'm going to do, since you don't like the new characters, is we're going to go change all your old characters that you already love. And then, ha-ha, you have to accept it or you have to be interested in it. And the fact of the matter is, that's not working. It's not working. It's making people walk away from characters. Fans are less interested in Tim Drake right now than they have ever been. And, you know, he can't, carry a, he can't carry a book, and he used to be able to. And it's because these ham-fisted stories, you know, that are just once the character, I mean, you and Doc talked about this on, uh, on Aficionados on Saturday, is that once a character becomes representative, everything interesting about them is stripped out because now they have, that's all they can be is representative. They can't be characters anymore. And I think that's, there's, there needs to be a balance if you're going to do these things, if you're going to have these, these characters and expect them to get over, there still has, they still have to be a character. They still have to have flaws. They still have to screw up. You know, they still have to have interesting stories, compelling villains. You know, it can't be the main thing about them. As you mentioned, he did obviously kind of talk about new characters at first, but he did clarify in a later tweet saying, since some of you are misreading this to be about new characters, let me clarify. It's about evolving existing characters, especially when they come out of the closet. The point is that many fans who say don't make him gay, create a new character, don't really want a new gay character. People don't want Tim Sheridan who wrote one or two projects in DC animation to come in on a character like we'll say Dick Grayson Nightwing that's been around for 80 years and all of a sudden do a big sexuality reveal on the character and just change everything that you've known and you've been reading about for decades upon decades where the reader has a personal relationship with the character. Now he said, but you won't accept my new characters either. That's because you didn't do the job writing the new character. I don't want you coming in and destroying things that exist and I want you to be additive to the world that you're writing in. If you can't cut the mustard and the best idea you can come up with is a non-gender, non-binary quilt person named Stitch, I'm sorry. You need to have better creativity and better ideas to get your characters over. It's not the reader's problem. It's actually the creator's problem. Readers love North Star. North Star is still a beloved character. They haven't done anything with him. They haven't done anything with North Star in forever. But, you know, I'd be on board for that. You've got Apollo and Midnighter. Those are characters people like, they're invested in. Those are two gay characters. How did those characters become popular? How did fans become invested in them? It's because, you know, Warren Ellis and Mark Millar, uh, or Mark Miller, I should say, uh, you know, they put in the work. They put in the work on these characters and made them compelling in their own right. And then their sexuality is just something else that's, you know, part of the character. It's not the They didn't character. chew on them with their sexuality. Right. And for Tim Sheridan to go in and say, like, you know, oh, we're evolving. You're not evolving because none of these characters have been set up this way. We've been reading their thoughts for, you know, 30 plus years. You know, they remember thought balloons. We used to see what the characters were thinking. And this is why people rejected Iceman coming out of the closet is because for 30 years we saw Iceman being, you know, a total horn dog. <laughs> and you know, skirt chasing, essentially. Uh, you know, he was always, uh, always interested in women. And then just because some writer comes along and makes the decision that, hey, I want a GLAD award, uh, so I'm going to, you know, transition this character into, you know, now being uh, gay or bisexual or, you know, whatever it is that they're going to do, you know, whichever direction they're going to go in, it doesn't ring true to the reader. And so the reader says, hey, you know, what, and, and as far as representation goes, let me tell you a story about Iceman. I have a friend who, like, hit me up and he was like, what's this about Iceman being gay? And I said, oh, and I explained the story to a storyline to him. And I said, yeah, it was kind of ham-fisted the way they did it. It was really, really bad. It made it look like Jean Grey used her powers to turn him gay. Um, just really uh, poorly executed. And he was bummed out because Iceman was a character that growing up he had identified with. You know, because Iceman was kind of awkward in the beginning, didn't really get the girl. You know, this was a character that he identified with. And now you took that away from him to make him a character that's representative of nobody. Nobody likes Iceman anymore. He's written like a stereotype. And all he talks about is his boyfriend or being gay or, you know, something, something, something. Or, you know, ooh, who are these top men? You know, it, it, these writers think they're clever putting this in, but they're not doing any justice to the character even when they do change them. So that's why fans are rejecting them. Well, and also the way that he's addressing things. I mean, you could see the first tweet got almost 15,000 likes. So a lot of people saw it. You know, and the next one got quite a few likes as well. So a lot of comic book readers saw this. And at this point, he's not being introspective on himself and what he could have done better. He's essentially laying the failure of what he created 
on the lap of the fans. I created something great and you didn't accept it. Rather than going and looking at what maybe worked in the past uh, and maybe studying that and learning from that, he's learning nothing other than it's the fans' fault. And that's really the worst, uh, I think, lesson a creator can come away from this with. Unfortunately, it's the take that they always go with is, you know, blame the fans. Don't do any introspection. Don't look at, you know, what uh, what you're doing and, and what you could be doing to get the fans on board. Uh, unfortunately, right now, we're in a, an extremely narcissistic time, it seems, as far as creators go. Um, everybody's kind of up their own ass and thinks that because they're a writer that they're in some sort of rarefied position. You see it from certain artists, too. Uh, instead of people being humble and thankful for the position that they're in, handling these great characters, you know, this is a... This is an honor to be writing to be writing Nightwing. What an honor, you know, all the giants that have worked on this character and uh, have built him up. And, you know, the Batman universe and everybody in the DC universe, you know, all these great creators that have gone before. You have a responsibility not only to their legacy, but to the readers and to the next generation that you'll hand these characters off to, to make them interesting and keep them intact. And right now what we see is we see writers interested in their own politics, in their own agenda, and how can I tell my stories using these characters instead of how can I tell good stories about these characters? I will give Tim this. He was polite to people that did respond to him. I do have this tweet exchange with Jim from Weird Science DC, contributor to the channel. He actually replied to the original tweet and he said, unfortunately, you can't just throw a bunch of characters at readers and then focus on, say, Character X, obviously talking about Red X, instead of these new characters and expect any of them to catch on. Tim Sheridan responded very politely. I agree. That was the DC call and I wasn't happy about it. The X story was not part of the original pitch, but we rolled with the mandate. I wanted to wrap it up in issue number five, but they wanted it to go all 12 issues. Curious, did you read it? I actually think we focused on a lot of newbies. This is what Jim had to say. I read every single issue and talked about everyone on our podcast. You focused a lot on a couple of newbies, Stitch in particular. You dropped the ball by really having no class time at all, which is such an easy way to show everyone's personalities and traits. Jim has a great point there, because if you do read that, that Teen Titans Academy run, there were no unique real personalities. Even Stitch kind of sounded a little bit like some of the other characters in the class, but they all kind of sounded the same. It was very much a Brian Michael Venice S kind of dialogue where everyone has the same exact voice. No one stands out, and therefore nobody's really memorable. Stitch is memorable because the character design is so stupid, and the concept behind the character is so dumb that it really sticks out. But the other nine LGBTQ characters that he introduces in the series really don't stand out because they all sound like they have the same voice. Well, it also sounds like a lot of overload, too. You know, you're juggling nine new characters, and so you're juggling, and I assume that the sexualities were diverse. I'm sure this, you know, it's like, as I recall, like, you know, it's nine bear, non-binary, and, and that, you know, you gotta, get, you gotta get everybody in there, but then you don't have enough time to spend with each character. And, and that class time, that's a great point from Jim, that would have really, uh, yeah, that really would have nailed it. It really would have, uh, you know, given you some ideas uh, as to who these characters were, and, you know, maybe some of them could have broken out of the pack and been popular. And that's the other thing. You know, the thing you have to remember is Stan Lee, Steve Ditko, Jack Kirby, they threw so many characters at the wall and not every one of them stuck. You know, there was hundreds and hundreds of characters they had to throw out to get like, you know, a dozen that really like resonated with people. So that's a that, that's something that people seem to forget. They think that they can just manufacture popularity like Vince McMahon pushing Roman Reigns as a, as a face, even though the fans clearly wanted him to be a heel, you know? And he's like, no, I'm gonna get this over. I'm gonna get this over. I'm gonna get this over. But the fans are telling you what they want. They're telling you what they want, what they don't want. And you have to be able as a creator to say, okay, this is the direction that the fans want it to go. How can I pivot to that so that they, you know, I, I retain the popularity of this book or I, you know, I get them on board, but still, you know, kind of, you know, be able to satisfy myself as a creator. The fans come first. You know, at least that's the way that I view it when I'm writing something. If, uh, you know, if the fans want something, I'm going to figure out a way to give it to them. I might not give it to them in the way that they expect because I want to keep them guessing, but I'm going to give them that thing. Uh, and I think that more creators need to remember that. This is a customer service-based business. People, You are asking people to put down their hard-earned money to buy your product. So therefore, you have to satisfy your customer. It's not about you. It's about the customer. And it's about your publisher making money. You need to make money for your publisher so the book can continue, so your team can continue to be employed. He did go on a bit of a block fest, which is certainly noticed, but hey, uh, the block oh. feature is there for a reason. I don't <laughs> well, think he you was know, using a block bot. I think he was just blocking individually. 
I guess I'd have to see the, uh, you know, I'd have to go in and look at the people that he blocked because maybe uh, maybe they were coming at him in a way that deserved it. You know, I don't want to prejudge that. I, I try not to block people, but every now and then, you know, you get somebody that just can't be reasoned with and you, you got to drop the block hammer on him. Another thing that Tim Sheridan kind of did during his comic book run, specifically at the end, he ended up essentially bringing in George Perez as an uncle to one of the characters in the story and there's just some stupid dialogue next thing you know george perez is like going yeah i remember when your dad was gay and it was so cool and he, like moments like that he's trying to use nostalgia bait and people's like love for george perez but he ends up making himself and the characters look ridiculous so tim sheridan tried to do a lot i just think it all came down to poor execution in the end and really he needs to be looking at himself instead of pointing the finger at everybody else and what what went wrong on that run it's, it's an, uh, the kind of introspection that you need to do as a writer. You know, when uh, when people tell you that they don't like something that you did, you should listen to it. You should, t you know, like look at it and see what, what it is that you can do to improve. Uh, you know, obviously not everybody who comes at you is going to be doing it in good faith and not everybody who has a complaint is going to have a complaint that's, uh, that's legitimate. Uh, you know, they can... People are free to not like the things that you do. They can't always, you know, sometimes they try to convince you that you don't like it, which is, you know, where you kind of get into that uh, that weird area of like, no, you can't you can't convince me of that. I'll take your feedback. But, you know, I, I liked what I did. Uh, but, yeah, reevaluate, reevaluate yourself all the time and the work that you're doing and what you could have done better. Every time I go back and I read something that uh, that I did, you know, I still like it, but I'm like, oh, I could have done this or I could have done this. You know, the benefit of hindsight. Um, you should always be looking at your past work like that. You should always be looking at your past interactions with fans and the, the feedback they've given you and uh, using it to improve yourself to do the next thing. And I think that's something that uh, a lot of writers today sorely lack. I covered Teen Titans Academy from issue one all the way to the very last issue with some very lackluster reveals. That Red X storyline and mystery just did not, it just didn't go well. That's, that's the God's honest truth. The introduction of the new characters, none of them really stood out in any positive ways. I definitely talked a lot about this and really wrapped up and summed up my feelings about Tim Sheridan's Teen Titans Academy. There's a lot more wrong than right in this comic book series. Let's just put it that way.